Okay, thank you for coming to the Spine Conference. Today we have the distinct pleasure of having a guest, Dr. Seeger, who's going to go over the pathology. Um, so we're going to review a case of metastatic disease to the spine. And I just want to review a little bit. It's a prostate carcinoma, so I just want to review um, what the prostate is. So do you guys know what prostate means in Greek? It's the guardian. It guards. I didn't know that. I, forget, I guess maybe I knew it from medical school, but I forgot it. So what does it guard? It guards all the male organs. So this is so just as a review. This is these are the male uh, genital urinal organs. And it, if you start in the urethra and the penis, in the first organ that guards everything is the prostate, and the prostate. Or do you want to explain the prostate, Dr. Seeger? Well, if you want to, but yeah. you, from the surgical point of view, I think you are more uh, mm -hmm. suited to do that. Than okay. I do. Uh, so the prostate um, uh, is an extension of the urethra, and it goes into the bladder. And um, we deal with it as orthopedic or, or spine surgeons because we put in catheters all the time, right, Aaron? And um, we, uh, we have issues quite often where men get benign prostate hyperplasia. Um, so the prostate's function is, a, is purely, unless I'm wrong, a sexual function where it emits uh, an ac alkaline type of fluid during the act of sex which neutralizes the acidic uh, fluid which is in the female vagina so that the sperm can um, uh, flow and make a baby. So um, it's purely a reproductive organ. Um, it's a very common uh, place for cancer. So prostate cancer. Um, how common is it? This is, um, does anybody know how many uh, team members to a water polo team? Seven. So you're the water polo expert. You should have known that, Aaron. So there's seven. So one boy in every water polo team, which is seven, will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in their lives. So one out of seven, one person out of that team. Now here's a football team, which is bigger, 35 kids, 35 boys. One of these boys is going to die as a direct result of prostate cancer. So most people do not die from prostate cancer. And it's something that most people live with. Now, Dr. Seeger, you can interrupt me if I'm wrong, but some 80% of all autopsies, the men have prostate cancer inside their bodies. So a lot. So most people can live their whole lives with this type of cancer. It's a very slow growing cancer usually. And like we already said, 16% diagnosed in a lifetime and 3% die. So very low. Uh, those are the ones that are low grade. Low grade. Because uh, the ones that are higher grade and they are Gleason's is called over seven, seven or up. Those are with a bad cancer that probably uh, wouldn't be found at autopsy. They would probably Present. be diagnosed before. Mm -hmm. So when when do a man when do they get diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer? Usually, it's in the seventh decade of life, between the ages of sixty and seventy. But I know, three percent starts in their forties. So how do you diagnose it? This is me at my annual exam. This is this is the face they usually give. When the doctor tells me it's time for the digital rectal exam. Like, oh God. So what is the point of the digital rectal exam? Is it just the torture people? No, it's not. So in the digital rectal exam, the finger is placed in the anus into the rectum, and then you palpate, you can palpate the prostate. And the prostate should be soft. And if the physician feels a hardness, well then that's very suspicious for carcinoma. And also a common thing is the prostate specific antigen, which is a protein that's emitted from the prostate. And it should be low in most cases but it can be high in cases of carcinoma, can be high in prostatitis, benign prostate hyperplasia, so it's another test. So if you combine these two things, digital rectal exam, DRE, and also prostate-specific antigen, uh, you can catch or screen people for cancer. And this is just a, 
a graph of prostate specific antigen from zero to nine and if you have a positive um, digital rectal exam and your age. So the older you are, the higher the probability of prostate cancer if you find something abnormal. So risk factors, anybody know any risk factors for prostate carcinoma? So we already talked about age, so we said that age. Uh, apparently um, African Americans are more likely to get it. Um, high fat diet. Can you think of anything else, Dr. Seeger? Age. Age mostly as people, so, and like we said, 80% of all men at, at autopsy have it, so most men get it as they get older. Okay, so now we're gonna go into our case. This is an illustrative case. Um, this is two years ago, an 80-year-old man had a fall and had low back pain and right sciatica. So Aaron, what do you see on the x-rays? This is a AP, this is a lateral view, and this is an AP view. Uh, Uh -huh, just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Can you see anything on the lateral? The, or I'm sorry, the lateral, there's uh, some anterior osteophytes. There's so there's an osteophyte here, there's an osteophyte here. Uh, let's see, five, four, three, three, two, one, L1. L1? Look, doesn't look square, does it's it? It's not square. Okay. And usually you can't, and, many, and quite often people are osteoporotic, they, they, you can't see much on the x ray. And this is what the patient looks like. It's not the actual patient, but he looks really, really similar to that. He's blind, he's elderly, he's 80, but he does care for himself. He has a very um, uh, supportive family that helps him. Okay, so the first thing they do in the ER is always to get a CAT scan. And um, two reasons, it's quick, it's, it's relatively cheap, and it's uh, available. So what do you see on the CAT scan, Aaron? It's not a trick question, you can just go quickly. Anything obvious? Uh, back up to L1. Uh-huh, so L1. It's not a square, right? Right. Remember in Sesame Street, this one, which one is different? Which one is not the same? Remember that game? So this one's square, 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 this one. This one's not square. You see the front is a little bit decreased? So Aaron's, Aaron thinks that that's a fracture, right? Right, L5 okay. doesn't look so great either. Okay, this is the MRI, what do you think now? Does that change your mind? So usually these patients get admitted and they get a, we get a consult, we usually order an MRI scan because we're not sure what's going on. So what do you find on the MRI? These are sagittal cuts. Uh, now it's not L1. Do you think L1 is fractured? L1 looks, nor it has the same So the signal is exactly the same as all the other ones, so why is it, why is it deformed? That uh, could be an old fracture. It probably is an old fracture that's healed, yeah. But do you see anything else? Uh, L, is that L4? L4, what do you see? Uh, it, the signal is different. There's probably a Signal is different, and also on these sagittal cuts. Good morning, Doug. Welcome. Uh, there's How, also stenosis. There's stenosis here, isn't there? What is what is back here that would cause stenosis? Uh, uh, either uh, herniated disc or hypertrophic. Hypertrophic ligament flavum posteriorly. The disc will be more anterior. So this is an 80-year-old man with back pain, um, Doug. So clockwise on L2, what do you think of the spinal canal? Looks good. Looks very good, right? How about L2, L3? Definitely stenotic, yeah. You can't, you cannot see any CSF. All the nerve roots are crowded into this very small area. How about L304? Uh, stenotic. Stenotic, right? Compare the spinal canal from here to here. How about L405? Uh, it's better. Centrally, not so bad, right? But on the right, you have what? Uh, uh, this herniation or osteophyte. So he, this man does have some stenosis. So what do we do, Aaron, for this man? He he's not getting better. Uh, we give him pain medicine, he's not walking, you just let him lay in bed? Uh, we give him an option of having surgery. Right, we're surgeons, so we always say there's an option of surgery. So what surgery would you recommend? Uh, a lumbar decompression, is it L3 to L5? Yeah, L2 to L5. Oh, L2, I'm sorry. And the fracture, uh, should we ignore it? Sure, we could do a kyphoplasty. So kyphoplasty is an option for the fracture. So that's what we did. So we did a, um, on 11, 29, 12, we did a lumbar decompression and we did a kyphoplasty at L4. So the kyphoplasty is a way to insert cement into the vertebral body. Uh, the cement um, flows through the uh, trabeculi of the vertebral body, fills it, and stops the pain um, by stabilizing all the trabeculi. Uh, and it's very, it can be very effective and it's not it's not a panacea. In other words, not every single person with a fracture needs uh, kyphoplasty. Some people do not need it at all. So 
does anybody have any questions about that? Like who or so my rule of thumb. I mean, I'm not a, I'm I'm not perfect, but the way I treat these people is is I ask them, you feel okay? Are you all right with the pain medicine? Are you walking around? Are you comfortable? And if they say yes, I was like, okay, that's it. It'll heal by itself. But if the people are laying in bed, they're not moving. They'll get a they'll get a pneumonia. They'll get an aspiration. They'll get a blood clot. And um, they'll get a bed sore. So those patients, I think, are best treated with kyphoplasty. Now, when we get these little tiny pieces when you do the procedure, is that uh, that you take uh, in order to put the cement in? Or? I'm going to show you. Ah, okay. So, um, so uh, Doug, do you, do you have any uh, opinions? You don't have to have an opinion of kyphoplasty, what I just said. You treat fractures. It's very controversial, you know, there was a big, uh, supposedly double arm blind There's two study. double blind study no funded by the government which says it doesn't help whatsoever. Right. But but that study, they they did it, they, um, there was a lot of crossover in that study. And also th that study, uh, they did it after like two or three weeks. Well, after two or three weeks, most people heal anyway. So it was an unusual study. And it was funded by the government, which you know what the answer is going to be, it doesn't help. So whoever funds, whoever funds the study, that's the answer you get, right? So uh, so kyphoplasty, before you insert the cement through the pencil-like instrument, uh, you inflate a balloon that opens up the area for the bone. The theory initially when it came out was that it straightens out the bone. It's been proven that it probably does not. But what I feel is very important, it creates a cavity where the cement can go so it does, does not flow into the spinal canal and paralyze the patient. I think that's definitely a benefit. Um, okay, so let's watch a... As opposed to a vertebroplasty. No balloon. Where you're just putting a big trocar in and pumping the cement in. Right, so the, the same, the, the vertebroplasty is the same thing but just no balloon. So I'll show you, this is a time-lapse video of a kyphoplasty. So that's like a needle, very sharp needle-like instrument, which is an all. This is a stop uh, of all the... Um, of all the pictures that I took and asked them to save every single one. So that cannula is inserting into the uh, vertebral body. Uh, it's sharp. So, and then I drill it. So instead of drilling it, uh, I can use a cannula which, which uh, obtains your biopsy. So I usually use a drill if there's no uh, reason for me to obtain a biopsy. And I'll tell you, maybe I should biopsy everybody. There's some evidence that maybe I should biopsy everybody. Um, but that's the point when I get the uh, biopsy. Then I insert this um, this this uh, wire-like instrument, and um, you'll see it. That's the wire-like instrument. I back it out, and then I inflate the balloon. So the balloon inflates anywhere between four and six cc's, depending on which balloon you use. That creates the cavity within the bone. Um, so then I took that out, and then I do the other side. The vertebral body has two pedicles, so I always I always do both sides. There is some evidence that you don't have to do both sides, but in my small mind, I feel that it's better to fill the vertebral body with as much cement as possible to, uh, to get as much cement fill as possible to increase the probability of uh, pain relief. But there's evidence that that's not true, but I'm not sure if that's true in my mind. So that just shows you where the diaphragm is, the, the lungs are here, the abdomen liver is here, the aorta is here, so you can pierce these things, you have to be careful. And then very slowly, sequentially, I, ins I insert cement. Now I, I made the image bigger, which is more radiation. I don't do it all the time, but when I put the cement in, I increase the, the uh, magnitude. And you can see the cement now is slowly filling the vertebral body. You see that? I'm pushing the cement with a plunger uh, type mechanism, and it's slowly filling. Now once it gets back here, that's close to the spinal canal or the spinal cord, so you want to be very careful and stop before it gets posterior. Does that explain it, Dr. Seeger? How we yeah. do okay. So, so we do that first. So I'm just slowly pushing the cement into the vertebral body. See how it's filling up slowly, and you should do it very, very slowly. That way, if the cement extravasates posteriorly towards the spinal cord, you'll see it and you'll stop. You'll say, okay, this is not safe anymore. I don't want to push cement into the spinal canal and paralyze the patient. I'm going to stop. So my rule of thumb is sort of the 75-yard line. Like I, I try not to put cement posterior to the 25-yard uh, line of the vertebral body. I always use football um, uh, metaphors because uh, it's fun. Okay. Because we're American, we're American, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Okay. So, should we biopsy everybody? 
Well, that, um, there was an interesting study at St. George's Hospital in London, which was presented in April 2014, where they reviewed 135 patients over the course of five years prospectively. Every single vertebral plasty they did, they biopsied it, no matter what. And these patients had no history of, uh, no history of cancer, or if they did have cancer, it was in complete remission. And they found a 5.7% rate of diagnosing a new cancer. So should we biopsy everybody now? What do you think, Dr. Seeger? I think you should, especially because it's part of your procedure. You are no extra not, time. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. you are just uh, getting these minute uh, particles of bone and put it in a... No, it's no time for us. Uh, no morbidity for the patient. And if I see something uh, different, what I usually do, I do a marker for carcinoma. And so just to screen the multiple pieces and see if I find something. And sometimes, you know, you do. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna start. Well, this this man, this is his case. He had an L4 kyphoplasty uh, uh, with an L2 to L5 decompression, and I, I can't remember if I I don't think I can't remember if I biopsied him or not. I think I did, but it was negative. And here's the cement and the CAT scan afterwards. I ordered a CAT scan because he was having some other type of trouble. You can see where the cement went, and you don't want the cement posterior to this line. So that's kind of like a perfect case there of L4 and you can see where the decompression was you decompressed the spinal canal back here and opened up his nerve put cement and he had some troubles afterwards he had recurrent sciatica pain so I ordered an MRI and this shows you what the cement looks like on the MRI it's black and here's the cement again it's black on the ac on the axial cuts the spinal canal now has been totally opened from the decompression you can see now the nerve roots have a lot of room and this is what the x-ray looks like with the cement so this man did very well and returned to his life, but then came back two years later and severe low back pain. And in the interim, he was diagnosed with prostate cancer, which we know is quite common. So anything uh, that you find uh, abnormal in the x-rays, Aaron? Uh, we can see the cement. Okay. And now if you look. Um, Don't tell me that's broken, because you said that last time that and it wasn't broken. <laughs> no. Huh? What do you see? Okay, you can't see anything really. Okay, how about the MRI? Oh, okay, we are going to go back to L. What? One. Now L1's broken? I thought you said it wasn't broken. Well, now it's different, isn't it? It is different. Now the, the signal within the L1 vertebral body has changed. It's, it's got the same shape, but now there's something in, there looks to be something inside of it. Again, here's the old kyphoplasty. And here's on a, on a fat suppression a T1 weighted image. What do you see at L1, Aaron? It, the signal's definitely different. The signal is definitely different. And the other thing that's, uh, it's very homogeneous throughout the entire vertebral body, which is uh, supposedly that's more consistent with uh, metastatic carcinoma. And it just happened to go into the fractured body. But it may still just be a fracture, it's hard to say. That was previously fractured? This was deformed on MRI two years ago, so probably was a fracture, like maybe, who knows, 10 years ago maybe. So now the, this L1 verbal body, and we thought it was just a fracture, so the standard thing is, um, uh, I saw him in the ER, I was a console, I just said, just pain medicine, I'll see him back, and he, did, he uh, did not get better. He boomeranged back two months later to the ER, because now he can't walk. His back pain is getting worse, he cannot ambulate, he cannot take care of himself. Um, because he had a history of a prostate cancer and general malaise, uh, a bone scan was obtained. And this, this bone scan showed uptake in the frontal portion of his skull. In his ribs, you see like here, 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 you see these ribs. Uh, also in the ileum, you see this, and the proximal femur, right? Which is always a concern. I don't have the x-ray, but I did x-ray his, his, uh, his hip, it looked normal. So if there is a involvement of the proximal femur, the it's cortex, dangerous. Hmm? It's, dangerous. it's a da very dangerous area. So as orthopedic surgeons, we always are very uh, careful of that area because if it breaks, it's a, it's a problem. And what is that, a nephrectomy or something? It's only got one functioning kidney. Yeah, I, no, he has hydronephrosis, I think, and it's not functioning. So this goes, this, uh, now this is not an unknown origin, but we're not sure, but we have a workup as orthopedic surgeons for skeletal metastasis of unknown origin. And this is, a, this is an article by Rugraf at University of Chicago in 1993. 1993, 
just so you get an idea, is when Michael Jordan and Charles Barkley squared off. It was a long time ago. But I was a resident at the time, and this was a great article where they took a 40 prospective patients with a skeletal metastasis of unknown origin. So why are orthopedic surgeons dealing with metastases? Because we deal with it all the time, right, Doug? And unless you have a tissue diagnosis, the oncologists don't get involved. So quite often, we're the ones who make this diagnosis, and we're kind of left out there. So this article is fantastic. They took 40 patients prospectively, and they, they had a protocol of the CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, pelvis, history and physical, chest x-ray, uh, and then they did a biopsy. And they found that with this imaging, bone scan, CAT scan of chest, abdomen, pel pelvis, history and physical, chest x-ray, they could diagnose 85% of all cancers before the biopsy. So the CAT scan caught 75% of all the cancers, the history and physical caught 8%. I think it was a breast cancer, and it was a bladder cancer, and it was a, um, I forget the other one. I think it was a prostate cancer. They examined them. A chest x-ray caught a lot of them. Is this men and women? Men and women. Mm -hmm. And the tissue only gave 8% of the diagnosis. So the diagnosis was made before the tissue, but the tissue was always obtained for confirmation. So the, the point is, um, and also labs, I added this. This was not part of the protocol, but I added it. I always get a serum protein electrophoresis for multiple myeloma. So the question is, why don't we just go ahead and just jump to the biopsy, why not? First of all, it could be a primary sarcoma of bone, which is a totally different surgery. It's a, you have to resect the entire thing with a margin, and it affects the outcome, especially if it's a young person. So you wanna avoid, um, unless you're a tumor surgeon, I, I believe, you should not be taking care of primary sarcomas of bone. It should go to the cancer surgeon. Um, also, you may find a better area to biopsy. There may be a much simpler area to biopsy than the spine. And also, it could be renal cell. So renal cell, as we know, is ex extraordinarily vascular. It can be anyway. And uh, it can lead to severe blood loss. So you should be ready for renal car carcinoma. You should be prepared. And in the sense that you, should, you need to have blood products and you need also to preoperatively embolize. Do you, have you ever biopsy a renal cell, uh, Doug? I did one renal cell case um, at the Mercy. Spine, of the spine, they're supposedly the worst things to deal with. Them. Yeah, I did one at Mercy, and um, I got the, um, we did the preoperative embolization, and right. uh, it, it still bled a lot. I mean, and, and we did the, we embolized it, we did the case 12 hours later. It still bled a lot, but it, it went well. So this man, so he has this fracture, and uh, I inserted the cement, which you know about it, and I also sent the biopsy. So um, now it's, it's Dr. Seeger's turn. We'll go over the biopsy. All right. Um, is this the first one that I got? Yes, they're all, all right. So just to orient you a little bit, uh, these are the bone fragments. Here is another one, another, you know, all this. And this is what this blue tissue here, this is not normal. Even at this magnification, this is either a um, myeloproliferative disease, a leukemia, or a lymphoma, or uh, something else. And let me show you next. This is, I put it here because it's, this is a, a more or less normal bone marrow. Uh, you can see the bone again. It's not as uh, this uh, rupted as in the other one, but look at the bone marrow. The bone marrow is normal cellular, lots of fat, and in between the, the maturing uh, red cells, platelets, and uh, granulocytes, and other cells. So uh, next, I go deep into the, uh, into the specimen just by looking at uh, a higher power, and I get this islands of larger cells. This is the maturing uh, red cells, and the, like this patient has an increase in the uh, red blood cells, probably prompted by the tumor itself. And uh, here I see these islands of larger cells with a nuclei, and in, see the little dot here is the nucleoli that these cells display. So just by looking at this, I know this is a carcinoma. Uh, before the, um, many years ago, even in, in that study, 1993, that you mentioned, um, we didn't use the markers. Now we have the markers. 
And although I know by history that the patient had history of carcinoma of the prostate, I wouldn't go and make the diagnosis of metastatic carcinoma of the prostate without the markers, because it can be some other tumor coincidental to the prostatic carcinoma. Next. When did, if I can interrupt you, when did markers, be, uh, when did markers come? What year? Oh, well, don't, oh, oh, they, in they, practice. they were there in 1990-something. Not as common, question, though. But no, the, the antibodies and the reagents and the like uh, in, uh, uh, in available to all labs, that's uh, no more than 10 years ago in which everybody can request an antibody and have the, the technique performed either in the lab, as we do for many here, or outside the lab. So take a look. These are the mature and red cells, and these are the tumoral cells, the big cells. This is just the nucleus of the cell, and inside the nucleoli, or the nucleolus in this case, several nucleoli here, very close position to uh, the bone in this case, uh, probably there are some uh, uh, osteoblasts that are being you know, uh, stimulated by uh, tumoral substances and produce new bone. Um, these are osteoblastic, in general, so-called osteoblastic uh, metastasis. They form bone. Next. And just another view to show you some areas that look very clear cells. So again, uh, renal cell carcinoma goes to the, the bones uh, very often. So this will be the differential diagnosis. So I cannot trust Dr. Antonia this uh, history of uh, carcinoma of prostate and go ahead and say, wow, this is just metastasis. So next. Can you show us an osteoblast on this slide? Uh, is it Well, not? they are here, you know, mm. some, some cells that are mm. attached to the mm. bone here. Okay. I didn't focus on that. Okay. But they, they are uh, like epithelioid, they look epithelial, but they are very attached to the bone. They are uh, basophilic, they have a lot of ribosomes and the like. And this is another area of the tumor to show you that, you know, this could be, you know, a, a renal cell carcinoma. They are all adenocarcinomas. Here is uh, attempting to form a gland. Uh, next. So we have that magic uh, PSA as one of the markers that uh, Dr. Antonia is uh, it's a protein uh, secreted by the cells. Uh, one of the functions it has is to dissolve uh, some of the uh, clot that the sperm, uh, uh, the semen uh, has, uh, has, and so it liberates or helps to free the sperm in their uh, way to um, the egg. So that's a very important function, biological function of the PSA, but besides, you know, we can use the PSA to mark these cells. And we did, and we have a strong positivity in all these clusters of metastatic cells. So I did this stain uh, next, and this is a higher power. There were areas of the tumor very similar to what I show you with the hematoxia and neosin before, in which the, the, the bone was packed with these cells, metastasis. Next. Oh. That's the last All one. Right. So, uh, oh, one more thing of, of note is his uh, PSA was 1,200. Right. It's extremely now we, high. We could do another thing. When, sometimes when the carcinoma of the prostate is very poorly differentiated, it won't give you the PSA positivity. And therefore, we have another uh, trick, which is to use the prostatic acid phosphatase. And so we label for that. Now, of course, uh, and in this case, the final diagnosis was metastatic adenocarcinoma uh, that is consistent with um, metastasis from non-prostatic primary. Now, other uh, uh, carcinomas may give you a positive PSA, but not this way. Okay, any questions from anybody? Okay, so the patient um, was given this diagnosis and he didn't want to be treated. He um, he said, I'm done. But he did, uh, he's on Lupron, which is um, the anti-antrogen, which does stop the progression of the uh, disease. So um, in men, where do we get cancer? Uh, oh! Sorry. 
Sorry, YouTube uh, fans. Can I have the appointer back? So, um, and then uh, the most common um, occurrence of cancer is uh, prostate, uh, followed by lung, colorectal, bladder. In the state of Maryland, there's a bit of a higher prostate uh, carcinoma uh, uh, pres um, prevalence, uh, but also lung, colon. Uh, in women, the most common is uh, breast cancer, followed by lung, colon. And met metastases uh, to the vertebral, to the bones, and we're talking about that because I'm, we're an orth was, uh, I'm an orthopedic surgeon by training, uh, presents with pain. And it's usually at night when you're at rest because uh, you don't have any other, during the day you have other things that uh, are on your mind, uh, like, your, like, like your boss yelling at you, like me, I'm yelling at Jessica, she doesn't notice painful conditions during the day, uh, and other processes. But at night when you're at rest, uh, that's when bone pain comes out. So where, does, uh, where do metastases usually go? Um, so this shows you just uh, one study of where they go. The most common site in this study was, like Doug said, the proximal femur, uh, which is a very uh, common place. Also the spine, 362, the pelvis. Uh, the proximal femur is a big problem when you get it uh, because um, it can fracture uh, and then you can't walk and then you need a, sometimes a big operation to fix it. <laughs> so I was just curious, like from the previous slide, you remember when the carcin prostate carcinoma was mostly diagnosed in people in their 60s or uh, yeah, between 60 and 70? How many people are there and this is just a, a diagram of our age, the United States population, and it, it's like it's pretty it's pretty even up until the age of 60, and then there's a lot fewer older people. Uh, this is women, this is men. As we get older, because obviously we die, um, and this is this is also a prediction of by the year 2050 when I'm going to be old. Um, there's going to be a lot of us out there, so there's probably going to be a lot of prostate cancer if I'm alive. So what type of cancer metastases? Most commonly, like Dr. Seeger was saying, breast, prostate, lung, renal cell, uh, hematopoietic tumors, thyroid. Yeah. Well, thyroid, just <coughs> if I can interject. Uh -huh. Thyroid right nowadays is, uh, you don't see practically metastatic carcinoma of thyroid because they get, uh, they get the excise or remove before they get to the bones. So it's very easy with fine needle aspiration. We get a lot of uh, fine needles of uh, easy technique, not painful at all, and you get a diagnosis very quick, and then the thyroidectomy, and that's it. So the incidence has been dropping yes. because of medical treatment. So how does uh, how do uh, cancer metastasize? Well, first it has to grow, and then to grow it needs blood vessels, so you need angiogenesis. And then the cancer has to invade into a, a, either a vein or a lymph node. And then it has to travel. And then it has to in, embed itself into the bone. It has to leave the vessel. And then once it gets into the bone, it's got to grow more blood vessels and grow. So there's a lot of steps involved with a, a metastasis to bone. And once it gets into the bone, the cells themselves, the cancer cells, release substances which can either, which affect the osteoclasts and osteoblasts, which cause the lytic and the blastic lesions that we see. So the cancer itself is, is not doing that to the bone, but rather it's stimulating uh, factors that cause the osteoclasts and osteoblasts to, uh, to either eat the bone away, cause osteolysis, or lay down bone, which is osteoblastic uh, lesions. And prostate's usually osteoblastic. Breast cancer is usually osteolytic, the two most common. So any questions about that? That's it for prostate cancer. So I just want to show a benign case, just so you understand what the MRI findings look like in a benign. This is an 86-year-old woman with, again, a low back pain and fall. And what do you see, Aaron? Don't tell me it's L1. It's L1, right? Why is it always L1? Do you have any idea? Why is the thoracolumbar junction always fracture? It's a point between kyphosis and lordosis. It's a straight spine compression fractures have been there. Maybe. I have another reason why I think. Stability hmm? of the ribs. Yeah, the ribs give stability, yeah. So it's a lever. Yeah. 
So it's the first point, first mobile segment, oh, and it's very stiff in the thoracic spine. So that's a very common area for burst fractures and car accidents and also for elderly fractures. So everybody gets a CAT scan in the ER, and uh, this showed uh, an abnormality of L1 uh, and T12. And here's the MRI, and the MRI appearance in usually, now this is not always the case because not all patients read the rule book, but usually in benign cases, it's a heterogeneous um, pattern in the MRI scan, not homogeneous. So the homogeneous uh, pattern of a tumor, I think is present because the tumor invades through the bone and encompasses it completely and it slowly gets deformed and fractures while in a fracture, uh, usually it's an end plate and it collapses and it gets becomes a demonist. So it's usually a heterogeneous uh, in the, in its uh, character on the MRI. And you can see how heterogeneous these fractures are. So it's uh, just, a, just a rule of thumb in general. If the fracture is homogeneous and change in signal, it's be suspicious of tumor. Not always the case. Uh, and heterogeneous uh, usually is um, benign. So that's it. So this is, um, this is where I'm going. I, this is where I go in August is Isle of Palm. Those are the two pictures I show, South Carolina. So any questions about prostate carcinoma? Isle of Palm, South Carolina, Charleston, oh, South Carolina. That's where we go, my family. Yeah, it's really beautiful. I love South Carolina. So any questions about prostate carcinoma, or spine, or kyphoplasty? Okay, thanks everybody for coming.